recording. There we go. Great. Okay, so I'm going to assume that you guys haven't looked at Miniscript or Mini Micro at all, and we're starting from square zero. Is that right? That's right. That is correct. Okay. Although I have seen that logo before, and it's mighty cute. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, well, so there's really two pieces here. One is the Miniscript language itself, uh, and then the other is Mini Micro, which is a sort of virtual home computer built on top of Miniscript. Um, and I think I'm going to jump right into Mini Micro because that's really the more fun part of it. And I think the my purpose this morning is just to sort of show you what it can do and give you a taste for it. Um, but uh, if you have any questions or want to dive deeper on anything, just let me know. Okay. So this is um, Mini Micro. It's running, you know, within a window, um, and it's supposed to look sort of like an '80s style, you know, Commodore 64 or something. Um, but at the prompt here, I'm actually typing Miniscript code. Um, so, uh, you know, here's some basic Miniscript. Um, and that's used also for accessing the disk. Unlike most systems, you know, even back in the old days, um, disk operations would be DOS or ProDOS or something, uh, and programming would be basic. In Minimicro, it's all the same. Um, so I can do, you know, when I type dir, that's running a Miniscript function that gets the file list and displays it and pauses if there's more and stuff like that. Um, out of the box, Mini Micro has two disks, but this um, slash user disk would be empty. Um, but there's a slash sys disk that is built into the virtual machine and it's read only. And it contains demos as well as some um, assets in the pics and sounds folder, um, some library code and lib, uh, and you know, some other stuff. Um, like startup.ms is the script that runs uh, when the machine boots up, and it prints that welcome message and so forth. Um, so if we were to go into demo, one gotcha here is um, because we're typing Miniscript code at the prompt, um, I have to put quotes around the arguments. If I just did CD demo, it's going to say demo is an undefined identifier. Um, so with quotes, CD demo, um, here's some of the demos that are built in. Um, and I'm not sure where to begin. Um, well, let's start with the, the first one, actually. Um, so I can load AC Ducey. Um, and if I wanted to view the code, um, I can just dump it to the screen with source. That's not terribly useful. Or I can use a built-in editor. Um, edit launches this uh, graphical editor. At this point, I can use the mouse, and I can select, and I can copy and paste, and all that stuff. Um, but let's just run it. So ACDC is a little betting game. And you're betting whether the next card is going to be between the first two cards that you were dealt. So will the next card be between a 7 and a 10? Not too likely, so I'm going to make a small bet. Hey, but I actually won. Um, did you guys hear a cha-ching sound just now? Uh, I did not. Okay, did so it's not. not all right, so it's not transmitting sounds apparently with the screen cast, um, but no big deal. Anyway, uh, take my word for it. There was a sound. Uh, Mini micro supports uh, sound effects as well. Um, between eight and a nine, that's actually impossible. Um, but I'm going to bet everything because I'm not too smart, and then I totally broke. Um, so this is a text-based game. Um, the uh, the symbols you see here are just Unicode characters. Um, the built-in font has a handful of non-ASCII characters in it um, for things like that. Um, I can you know clear the screen and get rid of all that. Um, oh, here's a better introductory example. Actually, let me load Countdown. This one actually is short enough to just listen to the screen. So you can see there's a for loop that looks a lot like Python, a print, and a wait. This waits one second by default and then ends the loop. So when I run this, it does exactly what you probably expect. So Joe, is, yeah. yeah. For just yeah. One, one second. Mm -hmm. um, my screen has frozen, and I don't know. Oh, OK, suddenly unfroze. OK, never mind. Huh, Bethany, were you seeing problems too? Uh, Jitsi has intermittent problems. Um, and this is, I, if, I don't know if either of you have looked at like the discussion that was happening in CodeBuddy's meta around Zoom versus Jitsi. Yeah. Uh, but 
you know, suffice to say, and I'm sure you two have been on other conferencing systems as well, the two-way communication with video and audio is not easy. Uh, and it also takes up a lot of bandwidth. And, and Jitsi being owned by uh, Atlassian, but being open source, doesn't, it's not as stable a platform as say Zoom, which is pretty flush with cash. So okay. anyway. All right, yeah. Um, Dylan actually suggested that I should use Zoom, but I wanted to try Jitsi because I never used it before. And it's so easy having it yeah. embedded right in the page, but maybe next time I'll use Zoom instead. Yeah. All right, well, bear with me and let me know if it's um, not updating for you and, and we'll pause or whatever we need to do. Certainly. Okay, um, so that's basic text-based interfacing. Um, but um, there, are, let's see. So Mini Micro actually has eight display layers stacked on top of one another. Most of them right now are transparent. Um, which is to say they're just off, but you can set any display mode or any of those eight layers to um, any of several modes. There's a text mode, which is what we're looking at here, um, pixel graphics, tile graphics, and sprites. Um, so those are the available modes. Um, and by default, there's a layer already set up for graphics. It just happens to be transparent, but I can do, for example, um, GFX, which is a reference to that um, default graphics layer, dot, I don't know, fill over. And give it the coordinates. Oops. <laughs> um, it's called fill not fill mm -hmm. I was being pedantic when I chose the API name. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's technically not an oval because ovals have straight sides. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> and, you know, different colors, whatever. Um, and you can see that this um, graphics layer is behind the text layer. And the text layer by default is uh, got a transparent background. So you can see through the text to the graphics layer. And basically that's the big idea with these eight layers is any of them can be transparent in, in places that you want them to be so that you can stack them up however you need to to make a game or demo or whatever. Um, I really like though that the text is transparent by default uh, mm -hmm. because kind of figuring out those trans Figuring out things like transparency and layers is something I think uh, people need to programming struggle really hard with. Like I watch a lot of people in CSS and HTML struggle with that. Yeah, so I tried to set up all the defaults so that it would be, you know, fairly sensible right out of the box. So out of the box, you can do text, graphics, and sprites, and they're all transparent in ways that you would probably want. Um, That's awesome. Yeah, but for example, we could do text up back color. Um, equals color dot um, purple. And now um, any printing gets this purple background, which you can see is not transparent. So now it's covering up the, the graphics layer behind it. Um, so can you set opacity on colors or is that a oh, little yeah. bit? No, you oh, can do cool. that. Um, the colors are uh, actually strings. So when I say color dot purple, that's just a map to an HTML color code, but I can put in something like, I don't know, four, 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 zero, zero, and then um, half transparent, um, and now, okay, it's a little funny looking because the text cells overlap. I've actually never tried that before, so <laughs> I might want to see if I can do something about that. But um, yeah, uh, that works for all colors. Uh, cool. All right, let me put that back to clear because I don't actually like a background color in my text most of the time. Um, but yeah, you can see here color is just a map. Um, and maps in Miniscript are just like maps in Python. They're key value pairs. Nice. And similar syntax as well. Um, so let's actually clear all displays and look again at demos, find some more fun stuff. Um, I don't know how well, oops, I can't think and type at the same time apparently. Um, I don't know how well Jitsi is gonna keep up with um, an animation, but let's just try. Oh, geez, I'm terrible at this. <laughs> you can up arrow to go to previous commands, just like, you know, at a Unix command line or something. Wow, I really am bad at this. There we go. Anyway, this is Flappy Bat, this is using sprites. Um, you guys probably want to look at the code because you're programmers. So we'll do a real quick whirlwind tour through the code. Um, here I'm loading a couple of sound effects uh, off the system assets. 
you can also create sounds on the fly by specifying frequency and you know a bunch of other stuff. Um, here I'm loading images. So file.load image gets an image from disk. Um, I'm setting up a display for sprites, although that's actually the default anyway, but just to make sure I do it in code. Um, sprites is a built-in class, um, but I'm, um, I'm adding properties. So these things like dy and frame and next frame time, these are not standard sprite properties. These are properties I'm adding to my particular sprite instance. Um, and then here's where I set the image. So basically these, these are the key bits of a sprite, the image, the X and the Y position. Um, there's also scale and rotation and stuff that I'm not using. Um, I have uh, an update method here. Um, this gets called on every frame that just handles flapping and, and the physics of the bat. Um, here I made another, uh, I made a class to represent sprites. So here's how you make a class in, in Miniscript. It's just an empty map um, or a map that derives from some other map. And then you start adding properties and methods to it. That's interesting. Uh, so that looks very much like the way you would do a struct in, say, the Go programming language. OK. And I haven't learned Go, but I can yeah. believe it. Yeah. It's instance-based um, object-oriented programming. So uh, a map is a class if you think of it as a class, and it's an instance if you think of it as an instance. But uh, any map can derive from another map. And when we do um, lookup, we walk the, the isla chain uh, until we find a match. Oh, cool. And that's basically it. And you know, there's a couple of other niceties. Like when you call a function with that syntax, um, it gets a self identifier, which is the object you called it on. Um, and then there's also a super identifier, which is a reference to the, um, you know, the super class map. Um, mm -hmm. Anyway, so this is all detail, detail, detail. And we'll go down to here. This is the main loop. Um, and there's nothing particularly shocking here. You know, this is doing the continuous scrolling function to handle the keys and so forth. Yield is a, a special uh, method in mini micro that um, waits until the next frame. Um, so it runs 60 frames per second. So this will wait the rest of the 60th of a, a frame so that you can get consistent timing. Yeah. That's really interesting. So uh, in Python, yield is, is used, of course, in uh, a generator and waits for a next call. Uh, and so you are using kind of that same idea, except that the next call is coming from the keyframe or the frame. Yeah, chain. sort of the host machine. Right. Right. Interesting. Yeah. Um, that's hard to read. It's uh, clear. Um, OK, so what else is fun to look at here? Um, Here's another sprite game. I won't belabor this because you know they're technically basically the same thing. But this is, uh oh. Well, that's embarrassing. Always when you're doing a demo. Um, line. I was actually gonna uh, poke you at one point uh, in, uh, in in the Code Buddy Slack because I went back to try to play that game and it wasn't playing. But I assumed you were just. You know, you were you were playing around with stuff, um, and so I must. I yeah. <laughs> um, let's see. Sys X block. I bet I've moved where those pictures live. So let's look. It's looking for slash sys pix block and then um, blank two three or four. So let's look for that. Actually. Um, was it? Uh, I've forgotten the syntax for this. I hardly ever use this function. Now let me just do this. OK, yeah, syspix. So um, that's where we are. Block, block two, block three, block four. Um, that should work. Um, one nice thing about having this sort of environment is that when I quit, all my variables that were defined by the program are still defined. So I could look at platform images and see what's in there. I hope you guys don't mind. I think, I think this was a useful exercise. Yeah, no, I think this is really cool. I, I actually, I know it's totally nerve wracking to be on the other side of this, but uh, I find it fascinating to to watch people debug and to talk about their programs like this. Yeah, okay. So um, our images look okay to me. Um, let's just check each one. 
because it's a little hard when they're all glommed together like that. Um, yeah, those all look fine. So why is it saying um, that it can't find width on line 52? Um, look one more time at that line. Self.image.width. Um, that would be the case if the image never got assigned. Maybe, is that possible? Um, I swear this worked the last time I ran it, but. <laughs> Let's see, so the platform's a sprite, it's got a config, it sets the platform images. We'll put in a check here. We can just say not actually. Um, and you know what? Let's just print that all in. No, better yet, we'll do it here. Um, I'm thinking of checking whether it actually has this. That's not going to work if the image is nil, though. Tell you what. I think the easiest way to get to, or fastest way to get to the bottom of this is just print the image here. Okay. Those all look like valid images to me. Um, and they all have a width property. Oh, and now the Moochie's moving. Oh, except there's a type error now. Huh. No, that's the same one. It's the same that's error the same we were doing before. Okay. Yeah, he was always moving until I tried to jump. And then once he's falling, we were looking for platforms that, um, that it could hit. And yeah. that's when we get the error. All right, we'll get to the bottom of this. I can't believe that this is going to conquer us. Um, <laughs> all right. I'm sorry, I interrupted. <laughs> no, it's fine. I'm just I'm going to try and think out loud as I do this so that you guys can can hear my thought process. But please feel free to jump in if you have any ideas. Um, we're going to say if self image equals null, then print uh, if self dot we'll say if not self image dot has index width, then print no width. Um, and if neither of those prints, then it should work. So image is null. Okay. So somehow we're getting a platform with a null image. Um, But on, on startup, we're not seeing that. Um, so that's really puzzling. Let's see, here's where we add the platforms. We make a new platform, we call config, we push it on our platforms. Let's check at this point. <laughs> you took the words right out of my mouth. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Maybe something would have missed with the push. Maybe something would have missed with the... Yeah. yeah. Sizes. Like maybe the sizes are being set some like too small or too big or parameters off. That's interesting. Um, yeah. Well, we were definitely using self. Like if we if we'd forgotten to use self here, then things would go wonky for sure. But since we are, it can't be affected by global variables or anything like that. Um, we're only adding four platforms, and the sizes are two, three, and four. So still stumped, but let's see if we gather more clues. Oh, I should have paid more attention at the beginning. Null image and add platform. Hey. So this is relevant. Mm. Um, also, I'm hearing this sad mochi sound, which is really cute. By oh, the good. Way. So this guy's are coming. Yeah, I'm hearing you too. All right, great. Um, okay, I'm sorry. I'm looking for the platform that's uh, up here. 
add platform. Okay, so if p image equals null, after we call config, then what in the world happens? Um, because we're checking. Oh, look, we're not using self here. <gasps> oh, How did that ever work? <laughs> Ooh. Oh, that, wow. Oh, wow. And now that you see it, I'm seeing it everywhere, but like. <laughs> I think that I originally wrote it not using oop, and then I thought I should make this a class, but I can't believe I didn't test it after doing that. Um, this one's okay, because here, this is a global function whose job it is to create a new platform. Yeah, yeah. So um, that one's not one looked, attached. Yep, and this one looks okay, yeah. Um, <laughs> hey, look, we have platforms now. Oh, oh. <laughs> I love this game. Now I can go play it. <laughs> well, yeah, I'm gonna have to go upload a new uh, build to the web to with a fix. But wow, I guess this was a really useful exercise. And I'll just jump to my death now. <laughs> All right, interesting. Um, but what so, was also really cool to me was that. Um, it felt like, I mean, I know you're the creator of this and you wrote this program, but it also felt like the bugging was pretty um, straightforward and pretty smooth. Like the code yeah. was, the game is, is fairly complicated looking at least when you play it, but the code wasn't so complicated that you couldn't kind of debug it. Yeah, like we zeroed in on the right area pretty quickly. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, and in a way, the debugging is crude, right? There's no stepping through the code here with an IDE. But on the other hand, um, you've got this tight connection, you know, where you can just inspect variables after the program has stopped and things like that. Yeah. Um, and you can print right on top of the graphics display. So it, in a way, it's kind of easy. Yeah. All right, that was a good exercise. Now, if I tried to save it, I haven't tried this before, but it should tell me it should have told me it can't do that because it's a read-only read disk. Um, so I would need to give it a different path. Oops. So I'm going to make a note to myself over here that I need to check uh, error messages when saving to a read-only volume. I should point out, this is uh, version 0 0.4. Um, so yeah, there's still some, some issues. Um, but uh, it's, it's evolving rapidly. I think in another month or maybe two, um, it should really be ready for real users. Okay, so let's see what else we've got going on. Um, oh, we're still in syspix. Let's go back up, down to demo. Um, oh, here's a fun one. This one. <laughs> I saw the graphics for that. I haven't played it though. Yeah, so this demonstrates tiles um, and you're just trying to trap the Wumpus and he'll try to get away. And once you kind of learn the, the way of it, it's not that hard, but at first it seems like it's impossible. And of course, now that I say that, is he gonna get away? The trick is you have to go way out in front of him um, and start constructing these walls so that you can lock him in. Oh. See, he got away, dang it. <laughs> nice. <laughs> anyway, so this is using um, this is using a sprite layer, a tile layer, and a text layer, of course. Um, so what's the algorithm for the movement calculation? It's uh, A star. Um, so I have a function to get all the neighbors of a particular column and row, and this is a little trickier than it would be on a rectangular grid. You have mm -hmm. to consider whether you're in an even or odd row. Um, I have a function to calculate. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought about using a star, but and I didn't. Instead, I'm doing a flood fill. Um, so I start with. Uh, you know what? I can show this because I left some commented out debugging code here. Oh, cool. Um, yeah. So let me run this and then explain it. Um, so let's say I just click here. Okay, so uh, these circles represent how far each cell is from the edge. And, and so I start by just assigning zero to all the outside cells and then I recursively um, assign, you know, for each neighboring cell, it's 
distance is one more than the neighbor. Um, but, you know, obviously there's a check where you never say it's longer than some value it already has. Mm -hmm. So it just fills from the outside in. And then the Wumpus just walks that gradient. He, t he steps to the neighbor that is closest to the edge. Huh. Yeah, so you can see when I start making a real wall here that some of these blocks get pretty far from the edge. Well, what's also cool about that behavior, if you don't know what's going on with the calculation, is that it appears that the Wumpus is moving away from your wall, right? You're, mm -hmm. you're placing the Wumpus, but it's just making the calculation in any direction of like how to get to the lowest number. Yep. Yeah, it seems like he's really clever, but he's really just walking the gradient. Is this a, is this a fairly typical method for um, evading or seeking? Yeah, I would say that the more typical algorithm is A star, which for seconds what I thought I'd done. Um, are you familiar with it? No, I'm not. Okay, um, A star is a search. It's it's just best first search. So if I were to start here and I'm trying to find a particular goal, A star works best when you have a certain goal. So I'm trying to get the Wumpus from here to here. Um, a greedy search would always step in the closest direction and then it would end up, you know, possibly going the wrong way before it concludes it needs to come backtrack and get to the goal. Um, a breadth first search would try, you know, all the closest spots and then all the distance two spots and all the distance three spots and it would find the shortest path to the goal but it's not very efficient um a star is the best best first search so it keeps track of um for all of the spots it's considered how expensive it was to get there so in this case how many moves it, it took to get there and then it considers the neighbors of those moves that are cheapest um so it's looking for uh, it considers spaces that are closest to the goal, but also cheapest to get to. Um, and it'll pretty quickly expand, you know, not too many nodes before it finds the shortest path to the goal. But in this case, I didn't use A star for two reasons. One, I want people to look at the code and be able to, you know, have a chance of understanding what it's doing. And if you haven't seen it before, A star looks pretty mysterious. And two, there's so many goals. Any edge space here is a perfectly valid goal for the Wumpus. And that makes it actually pretty hard to use a star. Um, you'd have to compute the distance from any point you're considering to the closest edge. And it just gets kind of thorny. So this fill method, uh, upon reflection, was an easier solution. All right. Um, Thank you for showing us that. I, that the having the circles visually, um, I I don't know if you're if you're doing tutorials or anything else like that in connection to this, mm -hmm. but that thought process uh, and those visuals to me um, are are really valuable. Like if I were to go uh, and make a similar puzzle or a similar grid, it would be very cool to see those steps. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, one of the features I'm gonna be adding this week is the ability to draw text into a graphics layer. And once yeah. I have that, I might redo that. So that instead of circles, I actually draw the distance as a number. Yeah. That might make it even better for understanding what's going on. Yeah, because you see the numbers, you see the, you see the mm -hmm. distance. Yeah, exactly. Um, okay, I think just one more um, demo for today, unless you guys want more. I've got more time, but let me load up. Um, it's not in here. I haven't put it in the system disk yet. Yeah, let me load. <laughs> Yay! I was hoping you'd go over to Tecto since I've recently yeah. been to Tecto. <laughs> yep, yep, that's what I did. So. Uh, um, this is using a, a, a simple um, heuristic algorithm to decide where to play. Um, I think it's what your code was doing too. That kind of inspired me. Um, so we'll go through this real quick. Yeah. Um, I'm loading O and X pictures. Um, I'm keeping uh, the board positions in a, in a list, um, a linear list rather than a 2D array because it just seemed easier to deal with in the code. So I mapped the 
array positions or list positions to um, map, uh, sorry, the board this way. Mm -hmm. And then there's a function to check if we have a winner. And it's just, you know, checking all the different cases, columns, rows, diagonal. Uh, so quick question for you. Yeah. Um, that is excellent. <laughs> but I do um, want to know if uh, you are going to implement or have implemented like slicing for lists. Oh, yeah. <laughs> It does have slicing. Excuse me. Sorry. But it's not obvious to me how slicing would have helped. I will. I'll show you later offline. Okay. I, I, right. I will need slicing uh, for these results um, uh, using Python. Uh, uh, some of them require a start stop step. Mm -hmm. I found it easier to read, but this is also really clear too. So. Okay. All right. I want to look at that. Yeah, but yes, um, list slicing in Manuscript is pretty much just like slicing in Python. Cool. When I was designing Manuscript, I tried to steal the best ideas from a lot of different languages, and you can definitely see the Python influence in it. Um, so here's functions to get the column and row for a, a position number. Um, function to draw a box, it's just using the graphics commands to you know, draw some rectangles. Um, I have to draw a, a mark, which is an X or an O. Um, here's a little function that gets a list of empty spaces. Now, in Python, you could probably do this with map or reduce or something. Um, I don't have those built into Manuscript, so I use a little for loop. And I used a little for loop too. I did not use map or reduce. I, I tend not to. Uh, I tend to, to do the same thing here for, for clarity's sake. Yeah, uh, map and reduce are very concise, but they're not obvious to beginners especially, are they? No, they aren't, and they are not. Uh, at least in Python, they uh, they're punished a little bit in their efficiency uh, okay. because the, they have to run in the Python interpreter. Uh, whereas if you use uh, like a comprehension sort of thing to do your map or a plain loop, uh, you can get efficiency because some of that gets pushed to the C level as opposed to running in the interpreter. So okay, that's interesting. Yeah. All right. Um, so then, to get the computer move, it's based on this um, would win method that you know, hypothetically says, would this move win? And I do that just by um, cloning the array list. And I know this is a little different. In Python, you could just do it like this. Yeah, yeah. Um, but in many scripts right now, at least you have to do it like this. And then we set the, the position, you know, as specified and check whether there's a winner. Um, and so get computer move is just doing these heuristics, you know, always um, take a win if there's one available, block a player's win. Um, and if neither of those applies, then I'm just having it um, return at random. Um, this is a random move because I shuffled list right here. Uh, and that's pretty and much it. So available at zero uh, is, I don't see you calling a random here. Right. How do here's, you... here's the randomness. I shuffled the oh, available shuffle. list. Got it. OK. Yeah. I don't think Python has a built-in shuffle, but. No. no. No, that's cool. Yeah, Miniscript does. It's got shuffle and sort. So. Um, that's pretty much it. I mean, you know, handling clicks is all pretty obvious. Um, and then here's um, here's the main loop. While we don't have a winner and there's still empty spaces, you know, handle a click um, and check for the escape key. So that's pretty much it. So for click handling, uh, which I have to confess, I'm I'm terrible at. Um, yeah. <laughs> How do you attach, where are you attaching the handle? Are you attaching the handle to the board? Or is it done automatically because it's running in this, this yeah, machine and so it's tracking the click for anything inside the machine? I, I, would, I think it's less complicated than you're imagining. Um, okay. there's, no, there's no event pump by default. Okay. Um, so I've got my main loop here it explicitly checks for the mouse button to be pressed. And when it is, then it calls handle click. And all handle click does, this is a global method. It checks mm -hmm. the mouse position and does a little bit of math to figure out the column and row. I see. You on. Hmm. And that's how all of the games and demos work. Um, so I, obviously, I've programmed in a lot of event-driven environments. And if you're making a GUI app, I, I get why that's really handy. But I think, especially for beginners, something like this is a lot simpler because there's no um, magic to it. There's nothing going on behind the scenes. Well, and it's really nice because it can get people. I'm sorry, I interrupted you. I'll stop. Go. No, it wasn't me. Were you saying something, Julian? 
No, I just said, hmm. <laughs> okay. Well, go ahead, Beth. <laughs> Oh, I was just going to say that uh, one of the things that I had to do mentally when I was walking through this, uh, which is strange, but um, because I, I've done click events in, in JavaScript, but um, when I was doing it in, in Python, I had to, to walk my brain through these steps. And so I was going to say what makes this really nice is you constrained it so that someone can get used to the idea that uh, there's this thing called the click and you, your code has to handle the click and they can wrap their minds around that and kind of grow outward from there uh, for the whole notion of listeners and other things that get you know more and more complicated as you do in GUI. So this is this is really nice, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, in fact, let me just show a different one. Um, somewhere I've got a little drawing demo. That might be in sys. I should probably clear that on. Um, yeah, scribble. Because this is an even simpler demonstration of mouse interaction. Um, might make it clear. So first, let me show you what it does. Whoops, I meant to say run. So it's just drawing wherever I click the mouse, and the right mouse button changes the color. Um, oh, that's really cool, yeah. Yeah, so let's look at this, because this is um, a pretty short program. Um, I mean, the only reason the set color function is so complicated is because I'm also printing the name of the color at the top of the screen. So if you ignore that, mm -hmm. here's basically the program. Um, and it just says, you know, if mouse button, which means the button is pressed, then do a graphics line. Um, and then here's the check for the, the right mouse button, which sets the next color. Uh, and that's it. So there's really no events. Um, you're just checking the state of the mouse. And you can do the same thing with the keyboard. Um, there is a, an input buffer, of course, and you can pull key presses off of that. But you can also just check for any key to be pressed and do something with it, which is how most of the games work. So you could do a little maze runner. And you could you could potentially do not only a maze runner, but a, a, a runner that backs up because you've got yeah. that buffer. Nice. Yeah. Yeah, and that's actually um, why a lot of my programs end with key.clear. This clears the keyboard buffer um, because otherwise, you know, if I've been checking with key pressed, oh yeah, here's an example of how you check whether a key is pressed. Um, that doesn't actually swallow the input, um, mm -hmm. at least in the buffer. So then when you exited the program, you'd get like all those keys pressed, like spewing to the to the command oh, line. Yeah, so uh, you need to clear it. Yeah. We clear it. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I think at this point, you guys have seen pretty much everything there is to see. Um, there's a little bit more with sound we could delve into, but that's not too exciting. Um, you guys have any questions before we quit? Is there is there a way to um, export or compile or some way um, move games or scripts that you've created here? Yeah. Um, to, to somewhere else? Yeah. OK, well, there's two things. The easy way is, in the editor, you can select all and copy, and then just paste that into something in your you know, favorite text editor. Um, and pasting works the same way. So you can copy and paste between the host environment, only if you download the app. Um, there's a web version of this, um, which has most of the same things. This is what you were using when you tried this before, Bethany. But um, because of limitations of WebGL, we can't save files and we can't copy and paste. Um, so this is really like, this is kind of like the store edition, you know, at Kmart, the, the demo models that you can play with, but you can't save your own stuff on them. Um, so that's one way. The other way is um, there's an export command, um, which I haven't used in a little while. So. Oh yeah, you just say file export path. Um, so for example, if I wanted to export um, one of these programs, I could file.export sunset.ms. And this works for images and sounds and then everything to it. It's a file operation. Um, it just asks me where I want to save it. Um, and then it writes it out to that file. Um, and there's a file.import that does the opposite. So this is how you would get your own assets onto your user disk. Um, your own images and sounds and things like that. At least it's one way. The other way is um, your user disk is actually just a zip file. 
So you could unzip that and use all of its contents with a file hierarchy and everything um, to your real disk. And then you do whatever you want with it, zip it back up and call it user.minidisk. Um, I should show that. And that's this file right here. And that's the, the user disk within Minimicro. So I could ostensibly um, put that under version control and mm -hmm. make myself a repo if I wanted to. Yeah, yeah. In fact, if you're going to do that and you're serious about it, you probably set up a script to unzip this thing into your repo um, working copy, and then do the opposite. Um, go from your repo working copy to a zip file for use here. And if you, yeah, and then you go through that process every time you, you know, sit down to work, and you'd have all of your files not just as a binary file, but as the individual text files and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, I can show you what that looks like. Um, but because it doesn't end in .zip, I've got to use a terminal. So yeah. Let me just do this real quick. OK, so here's these files that we were looking at before. And I have a, oh, it's asking if I want to replace it. Um, sure. There we go. So there's the whole contents of my user.minidisk, including images and um, <laughs> dot .ms file. This is, this is one of my standard test images. It's a transparent GIF. Um, and these MS files are just um, text files. Um, again, you know, because of the extension, Finder doesn't know how to preview them, but I can drag them into um, my favorite text editor, and all the source code is there. Very cool. Yeah. Um, the other thing I want to point out, in case you haven't already seen it, is our Triad interface, um, which, if, yeah, if you make the window wide enough, this gets side-by-side -side code here, output here, and you can run code right from within your browser. Um, and it can even take input uh, and do weights and things. That so is really awesome. Yeah, it, it's pretty slick. Um, so when you just want to play around with the language itself and not all of that sprites and sounds and stuff that you might provide, this is the quickest way to do it do it. Um, and I've put a fair amount of effort into a, a tutorial here that, you know, for a complete newbie, starts you with print one, two, three, and then teaches you about numbers and, you know, variables and functions and all that stuff. That is sweet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. Yeah, this was thank fun. So this is my first time. hangout. And thank you for joining me on it. I had a lot of fun, too. Yay. Great. <laughs> All right. Talk to you guys. Okay. Bye.